talk today about, it's kind of a continuation of Christ slain from the foundation of the world, but I'm going to talk about in Christ. And uh, it's kind of a, a touchy subject to most of the body of Christ. And, um, you know, uh, who is in Christ is, is uh, you know, kind of kicks Western theology out of the box and actually reorients it back to uh, early church and, um, and how they saw it. And, um, but uh, more important is breaking out of, out of uh, some ivory tower theological position. I, I don't know if you know, but most of our theological positions have changed dramatically from the early church. And um, part of that was Augustine, part of that was uh, Calvin, and uh, you'd be surprised how much has actually changed during that time period. But really, being in Christ, you really is the simplest, like, get down to simplicity of the gospel of grace. Because if, because if you don't think that everybody is in Christ, then what happens is you have to do something, and then you step out of grace. Because grace is free. Grace is everything Jesus did. And so uh, the question is, I want to pose today, is who is in Christ? By, the, by that we mean, are you in Christ when you believe and become a follower of Jesus? Or was all humanity in Christ on the cross? The implications are staggering, actually. But if you get it in Christ when you believe... It means that you're believing as the cause of God's forgiveness, salvation, righteousness, uh, rather than the work of Christ. And so I want to pose some things. I want you to just pay attention to Scripture. You may have to, like, go online and watch this over and over and over again to actually get it all, because I'm not going to try to go too fast. I have 14 pages, but that doesn't mean it's big print, so it doesn't mean I got hours and hours to talk. But... um, I want to start out with the premise, so in Christ, I want to talk about uh, Abraham for a moment. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, we're going to, we're going to start there. And um, In this, um, the author of Hebrews demonstrates the superiority of the new covenant, Melchizedek, to the inferiority of the law. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 7 that one day Abraham, returning from the battle of the kings, this in Genesis 14, offered a tithe of his spoils to Melchizedek and received from him a blessing. Abraham did, uh, did so, Levi is therefore of less account than Melchizedek. Because this comparison here is actually between Melchizedek, who is a type of Christ, and Levi, who is a type of the law, and a type of their, their covenant. And so, uh, because of the fact that Abraham offered tithe to Melchizedek, uh, if that's true, then Jacob also was in Abraham, in the body of Abraham, not yet born. It was Isaac before Jacob, offered to Melchizedek, which in turn, that Levi in Abraham offered to Melchizedek. If you know that scripture, we'll just read it uh, for you in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 7. Let's look at it real quick. Verse 7. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Here, mortal men receive tithe, but there he receives, of whom is witness, that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithe, paid tithe through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father. So we see this um, process here of being in somebody before they were even born. Does that make sense? You see, Levi was in Abraham, and through Abraham actually received, gave tithe, but actually then became the tithe receiver. So he was in Abraham. So we see this process that is very important because people can say, well, how can you be in Christ before you were born? Well, here you go. Right? Here's Levi in Abraham before he was born. So he had all the blessings of Abraham before he was even born. Isaac had all the blessings of Abraham before he was born. So he was actually in Abraham as we are in Christ. So it's very important to actually understand that. So uh, 
So that's our biblical precedence of being in something before you were even born. Is that clear? Is it clear as mud? <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to kind of bring that up. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that because I want to show you how we are in Christ. And uh, so, like I've said before in Revelation 13, 8, I think it is, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So you, if he was slain before the foundation of the world, that means before Adam sinned, he was already forgiven because it was before the foundation of the world before the world was even created. And so, uh, but who was in Adam? So we can't stop with Abraham. We've got to go farther back. Uh, isn't everyone in Adam? Well, what does the scripture teach? So, so that's why here's another in, is everybody is in Adam, right? The Bible's very clear on that. We'll show you a lot of scriptures on it. So, so as Levi was in Abraham, everybody was in Adam. So when Adam messed up, messed it up for all humanity, right? So who was in Adam? Uh, Eve was in Adam, of course. And uh, Adam is just a type of mankind. But what you need to know is that no one has been in Adam since the death of Jesus Christ. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody has been in Adam since the death of Jesus Christ. And that is a shocking revelation to about 99% of the Bible of Christ. Unfortunately, this is true. So what we're going to propose to you today, like I said, uh, what we, when we teach, we never tell you you have to dislodge your brain and just believe everything we say. Because that's what I was taught. My pastor was infallible. That's what I was taught. My pastor taught it. It was 100% correct. Well, you know, we try to be 100% correct. But uh, how many of you have ever been wrong in life? How many more than once? How many have been married, are married, and your wife has told you you're wrong? <laughs> yeah, I... I there, there isn't any man here that hasn't had that told to them once. And if you haven't been told, it's because you've been married a day. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the honeymoon stage. <laughs> You're in the honeymoon stage. She just hadn't been honest with you yet. <laughs> so, um, so what you need to know is that since Adam's death, uh, you know, uh, would you agree that Jesus as the son of man is greater than Adam? Oh, yeah. Would we all agree that? So if everybody died in Adam, if Jesus is greater than Adam, doesn't it make sense that all were made alive in Christ? Otherwise, Adam is more powerful than Jesus. Did any... Now, people say, yeah, but if it's our choice. Was it our choice to be born in Adam? Was it our choice to, to actually uh, be born supposedly into sin, was it our choice? No. So, if it wasn't our choice, and if it's now our choice, then what Adam did is greater than what Jesus did. Yeah. Right? So, uh, let's look at... Uh, I found this years ago, actually when the Lord led me to the gospel of grace, Romans is a beautiful picture of... In Christ and in Adam. The wages of sin is death. Adam. Right? But the gift of God is righteousness. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is righteousness. So it's a comparison. So when you read Romans, do not read the sin part as part of you. Because you will be confused. Because it is a total comparison of being in Christ and in Adam. And I saw this years ago, and I didn't know what it was. And so as I started studying scholars, they, they started explaining to me that it's a comparison. The whole book of Romans is a comparison. So people used to say, you know, to Christians, you know, brother, if you sin, the wages of sin is death, and you will die. And, and it sounded Bible. How many ever heard that when you, from a preacher? It sounded Bible, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Because it is in the Bible. But it's not for Christians. Because there's too many scriptures that invalidate that. Like, he doesn't remember your sin anymore, Hebrews. He's not counting your sin anymore. Right? Right? So how could my sin be death if he's not counting it and he doesn't see it? Right? And you don't have to say right just because I say right. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So let's look at this. So is everybody in Adam and everybody in Christ? Romans chapter 5, let's look at it, and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, we know that was Adam, and death through sin, and thus spread... Death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Who is a type of him who is to come. Now he's talking about Jesus now a type of him who is to come. But the free gift, Jesus' free gift, is not like the offense. For by one man's offense, many died. Now, I'll show you this a little bit later, but the word many there, every scholar agrees that the word many there is just a, a, way, a Jewish way of saying the, the, the all. So they would say many that just meant everybody. And I'll show you that. I've got this uh, scholar's uh, word here. But, for by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. See, that's why I've told you guys that When you really understand the gospel grace, you will not be condemned one day of your life again. Because condemnation came from Adam, from the sin. Righteousness came from Jesus. And so they are polar opposites of each other. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification, verse 17... For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace, not work for it, just believe it, just accept it. And the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Jesus Christ. So, how many people were in Adam? Everybody. Okay? So, how many people are in Christ? Everybody. Everybody. All right, now let's keep looking at this a little bit more. So, uh, so every scholar agrees that the Greek categorization for everybody or many is, is, means everybody, all. So Jesus is, is, in other places, called the last Adam. I want to show you that real quick in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So here Jesus is being compared to Adam. The first Adam was a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Why? Because you later on, you keep reading here, you can't see the kingdom without that, without that life-giving spirit of Jesus. And so, the last Adam, so, if, if we, you know how some things go extinct, let's just say birds, let's just say that for some weird reason, the robin went extinct. We would say that that was the last robin, Correct? 
So when it says the last Adam, that means Adam is dead and gone forever. The last. The last. I, I can't stress this enough. The last Adam. Yeah. Jesus is the last Adam. Because he bore all the sin of the whole world at all, for all time. He is the last Adam. Mm-hmm. You might act like Adam. You might talk like Adam. You might think you are Adam, but you are not Adam. That's right. Because yeah. he's dead. This is not real complicated, actually, to be honest with you. This is like a theological study, but it's not really that complicated. People have complicated it. So let's look at this a little bit more. So... How much, do you, how much of Adam do you think is left? The dude was like, how many, whatever, they say 6,000 years. Whatever, 6,000 years, guess what? There isn't anything left but a little pile of dirt, if there's that, because water has washed all that away, right? There isn't anything left. And that's why the Bible talks about reckoning you, yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. Consider yourself the same, yeah. that, that the old man is done. Consider that, reconcile that, understand that. Yeah. That's what the whole message of the gospel is. To understand you are not in Adam. You are not Adam anymore. You are in Christ. That's the whole message of the gospel. I like this in Mark fifteen thirty seven. It says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed out his life. Just like God breathed the breath of life into Adam in the beginning, Jesus, at the last, as the last Adam, breathes out the last breath of Adam. He said, it is finished. You know, it's interesting because it says the first Adam became a living being. It means a breathing soul. And I, I talked about this a little bit more. I've been always taught that the soul is eternal. But the word soul there back in Genesis is, I think it's the Hebrew word nephes. I can't say it quite right. But it actually is the same word used for all the animals also. So Adam got the breath of God in that, but Jesus became a life-giving spirit. Big difference. Big difference. So, gosh, I'm going to just read this scripture so you can ponder it later on. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, I want to, uh, we just read that about it. Adam, uh, the last Adam, Jesus became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are made of dust, as is the heavenly man. So also are those who are heavenly, and as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So many people think that's like future. I do not. I think it's both. I think it's now and future. Because how can you be conformed into the image of Christ if you can't bear the image of Christ now? So I think it's both. But everybody pushes this off to the future. Someday we'll be just like Jesus. Well, you know, the scripture says that when he appears, we will look just like him. Apparently, we're being conformed into the image of Christ from glory to glory, the more you think about who you are in him, the more you're bearing that image. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's why meditating on Scripture and who you are and what Paul says is not a law. It's actually getting our brain to understand we're not Adam anymore, that we're actually Christ and in Christ and who he is on this world. So as he is, so are we in this world. So let's look at this a little bit more. What verse am I on there? Um, Okay. So we'll also bear the image of the heavenly man. Verse 50. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot enter, inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So this is where a lot of them get the kingdom is somewhere far off. When Jesus is going to bring it back, we're going to all have heavenly bodies, and then he's going to rule forever. This is where they get this. But... This is not true. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all sleep, but we all, shall all be changed in a moment. At the twinkling of an eye of the last trump. We're not going to talk about the last trump a little bit today. But the trumpet will sound, the dead will be ri- raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. I want to ask you a question. When did you get eternal life? Well, the moment you awakened to it, that you understood it, but when did it really happen? When he manifested. When he manifested it, but from the foundation of the world, then it was fully manifested in Christ at the cross, so we could all view it. Yeah, eternal is is a word outside of time. Austin was saying, yeah. So. When did you get in Christ? From the foundation of the world. When it was actuated so you could actually see the picture of love and see who you're going to be manifested, see what you're going to look like. That's why Jesus came, so you could see what we were going to look like. We could see the image we're going after. That's what Jesus did. So, So anyway, so... This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, so did Jesus defeat death, hell, and the grave at the cross? Yes. Or is he going to do it someday? Come on. Uh, come on. See, we always picture this. It's we're not going to physically die anymore. And so they look at this, well, we're not going to physically die anymore, so I'm going to be uh, immortal, or I'm going to be eternal. No, you already have eternal life. Yeah. You're not waiting to get it when you die. Yeah. So let's look at this a little bit more. I saw this quite a long time ago, but I just didn't really preach it. But this shall be brought to pass, the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus already did that. Oh, death, where is your sting? This is a quote from the Old Testament. But, oh, Hades, where's your victory? Now, look at this. The sting of death is sin. When did Jesus Jesus deal with sin? So is there any more sting of death? No. Death should be a celebration now. When people die... I mean, there are some people who think that we that as the revelation increases, people will live longer and longer, and I don't have a problem with that. That very well could happen, um, you know, because there's you know there's scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah, that we will live as long as trees. Trees, some of them live. There's some trees thousands of years old. They found. So I I don't know, you know, be it unto you according to your faith. But look at this in verse fifty six, the string. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. When was the law finished and over with? Nailed to the cross. cross. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this whole thing is summed up in The law is over. Death is over. We now inherit the kingdom of God. We now have this this body that we can operate out of. It's called a spiritual heavenly body that we're operating in. And the more we get our soul to line up, the more we look like that, we will end up looking like Jesus. So when, at the end of our life, when we meet Jesus face to face, we'll go, man, 
I look like you. We must be brothers. So Jesus is the eternal spirit. He is the life-giving spirit. He is the immortal spirit. It talks about that in John 1, 4. So I want to read you Young's literal translation of Romans 5, 15 through 18. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if by the offense of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the free gift in grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. So then as to one offense, all men It is to condemnation. So also, through one declaration of righteousness, it is all men to justification of life. And that is literally how the Greek reads. All men. All in Christ. So Adam brought death to all. Jesus was superior, brought life to all. Not only that, through one... Graceful, free declaration of righteousness to all men. We aren't individually called righteousness. When we believe, we were declared right because of Jesus. You cannot be an Adam and through no effort of your own, we were in Adam before, Now we're in Christ through no effort of our own. Now will you see the kingdom without understanding this? No. And that's why it used to always confuse me that that some people wouldn't see the kingdom and some people would see the kingdom. And so most of the body of Christ doesn't see the kingdom. They don't even believe it's here. Right. What's that? Yeah, there's a veil. They still have so much Old Covenant and Old Testament in their belief system that they don't know the veil was removed in Christ. I mean, I was taught so much of the Old Testament stories and and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, especially like Ananias and Sapphira, and not Ananias and Sapphira, sorry, go back to uh, Korah. And how many were taught Korah? Come against leadership. And you were fried. Listen, I tried that a long time ago. People come against me like, you're going to be like Korah. And it never happened to them. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't. It just didn't happen. I was waiting for God to like nuke them from heaven, you know, or open up the earth and swallow them and that kind of thing. It just didn't happen. And they were mean people who didn't have the love of God, you know, to come against you. Because I'm very loving. I'm very kind. You know, I don't know why anybody wouldn't love me. (laughs) They may not love my doctrine a lot, but, you know. So, so believing doesn't make you, make Jesus the Son of God or the Son of Man. Your believing doesn't make Jesus go to the cross or make him die for your sins. Your believing wasn't a trigger to raise Jesus from the dead. You had no part in making... Uh, in God making you right with himself, you contributed nothing. Your only part is to see it and let the faithfulness of God produce the faith in you. That's why it's grace. Grace means free gift. It means you didn't earn it, didn't do anything to get it, didn't have to confess, didn't have to do anything. It's just a, the message carries faith. So who is in Christ? Here's what the early church fathers said. This is a quote from Clement of Alexandria. This is in 150 AD. He lived from 150 to 215. All men, in, all men are Christ, some by knowing him, the rest not yet. He is the Savior, not of some, and the rest not, for now he is the Savior and Lord, If not the Savior and Lord of all, if not the Savior and Lord of all. So basically, he was saying that 
that he's a savior. Some don't know it yet. And they'll probably wait until they go to the grave. And then they meet him. See, God, Christ is greater than Abraham. Let's look at, we've done this a few times before, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. One of our favorite scriptures we've been meditating on. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, how many did he die for? For all. Then all died. Yeah, but <laughs> I have to bring this up. Hopefully, I'm going to, the, you know, the Bible clearly says, so I'm going to hopefully clearly show you what the Bible actually says. It, it clearly. That's, that's a joke among our leaders here. It, it clearly. So the Bible here clearly says, that one died for all, then all died. When did you die? On the cross that day. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. So just the word should tells you that some won't and some will. Right? Even though they all died with him, they were all on the cross. Yep. Listen now. If, if you died with him on the cross, and all your sin was nailed to the cross, the only way that you supposedly go to a hell or away from God is sin, correct? Right. But if your sin was on the cross, okay, wait a minute. Jesus, could you imagine... At the heavenly throne room, he's going to have his cross, going to be on it. And you walk up and you're like, sorry, eh, you don't go to heaven, you go to hell. He grabs your sin off his cross and off his body and throws it back on you. That's scriptural. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> That's what would have to happen. I don't think we realize how dumb that is. So anyway, let's keep reading. So they should live for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Why? Because Adam was flesh. We don't regard anybody according to Adam anymore. Even though we have known Christ according to flesh, yet now longer, or we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone, as a result of this, when you read therefore, as a result of the verses before it, all being in Christ, all sin being on the cross, all died, all were made alive, right? So therefore, this is not, uh, therefore, if, if you choose, no, this is a therefore because of what Jesus did. Right, right. Yes. So therefore, if any man is in Christ, old Adam, everything old has passed away and all things are new. And the word become is not there in the Greek. I used to preach that a lot of times. Well, we're becoming new. No, you are new. Your soul might be coming new. Because I used to preach this, there's this process of becoming new. No, the process is in your brain. It's not on God's half. You're already new on God's half. Yep. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, okay, let's keep reading this. So, all things have passed away, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Through your confession? No. <laughs> through your works? No. Through... What Jesus did by taking all your sin and nailing it to the cross. You were there that day. Yep. Come on. And of course, he's given us this ministry of reconciliation that God was in Christ reconciling the world, the whole cosmos, yep. to 
himself. And not imputing their trespasses to them. So the only way that you don't spend eternity with God is that you have sin that hasn't been dealt with, supposedly. But here he says he reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and committed us the word of reconciliation. And it isn't even be reconciled. I used to think that. Be reconciled. No, you are reconciled. This is what Jesus has done. Because be would put the responsibility on them to accept it and think that they're earning it. But you... So... So that... So our message is, here's what Jesus has done. He took all your sin and nailed it to the cross. He no longer looks at you like that. You're not in Adam anymore. You're in Christ. Everybody would would die in Adam, but Jesus, the last Adam, took all the sin of all mankind. And so you are reconciled to God. You can have a great relationship with the Father. So all died in Jesus The whole Adamic race died with him. All humanity died with him. This is similar to how Levi was in Abraham. See, the whole cosmos was in Christ. Look at Colossians. Let's go to Colossians real quick. And uh, verse 1 and verse 13. I love verse 12 because it says, give thanks to the Father who has qualified us, past past tense. I'm not getting qualified. He has qualified me to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. I am not working to get qualified. I am qualified. He has delivered us, past tense again, from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. You know what this word conveyed means? You are an enemy captive. And what this word really means is that, say, Austin is is in sin and he's an enemy captive of the devil. Jesus comes up and literally, no choice of his own, grabs him, follow me because I'm not going to pull you, and conveys him, means he, he ran him, he pulled him, he got him into the kingdom of light. No effort of his own. Literally forced you. Yeah. Now he doesn't force you to accept it. But he gave you no choice. He pulled all of Adam, all of mankind into himself. Yeah. Yeah. And conveyed there is a, like a military term of a captive being grabbed and forced and pulled. And that's what Jesus did for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. We almost tripped over each other, too, you didn't we? Did. You got big feet. I'm sorry. <laughs> but people don't understand that. It, 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 they, well, you know, it's when I did it. No, it's not when you made a choice. He took all of Adam, put it on himself, and, and, and literally pulled us out of the devil's snatches and away from Adam and away from our old life, and away from who, who we are, we're in Adam. He did this at the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's keep reading where we're at here. Let's see, I was in Colossians, wasn't I? Okay, so, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. How many, How much of creation? All of creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things... 
and in him all things consist. How much? In him. That's why the whole world has to be in him, because if Amanda wasn't in him from the foundation of the world, and especially since Jesus did this, then she would disintegrate into billions of little particles all over the world. Because she is held together by him and in him. See, the whole world was made for Jesus, not for the devil. And they, everything consists in him. So if an unbeliever wasn't in him and consisted of him and, and was held together by him, people say, well, there's going to be a great war. Listen, if all that was true, all you'd have to do is go, you're not in me. Boom. And the whole world would be, except for Christians, would be annihilated. What in the world would he need horse's bridle blood for? I mean, that's out of Revelation, if you're like, confused on that one. That, why would he need that? All you'd have to do is say, you're not in me, boom, because I hold everything together. Right? Just, it's over. He doesn't need a big show. So in him all things consist, the head of the body the church is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, and in all things he may have the preeminence. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile how much? All things on earth and things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. He reconciled all. And you who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet... Now, he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. I tell you, if the body of Christ would just get this, I, I cannot tell you. If you go to a church and preach, how many haven't forgiven people? Or how many have sinned today? Or how many think your name is halfway erased out of the book of life? And that if you want to have a great altar call, preach all that stuff. Because you'll get two-thirds of the body of Christ who are super ignorant because their pastor wants to keep them under his thumb. Why? Because people keep coming, people keep giving, people keep, they think they're forced to do something. We should gather together because it's supposed to be a love feast, the New Testament calls it, where we enjoy each other, we love on each other, we're the body of Christ, if each other needs something, we're there for each other. There's no force stuff. Be surprised how many people do their duty every Sunday morning. I love the Catholics, but the Catholic Church over the ages puts so much fear in people. Unfortunately, these people are super good people, but super afraid. It's sad. I, had lots, I have lots of Catholic friends who are very sweet people, love Jesus. So he reconciled the whole cosmos to himself. Oh, let's see, Colossians one twenty six. I don't know if I read that. Here's the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generation, but now has been revealed. To God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery of the, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. This was written to the Gentiles. Christ in you. He's in you. It doesn't say you made a confession. It says here's the mystery, guys. Christ is in you. Yeah. 
Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ Jesus. And that's the job of, of the fivefold ministry gift, is to present you mature, to tell you this is who you are. This is what Christ has done. This is how much he loves you. You are already holy. You are already righteous. You are, let's just act like what we are. Let's look at Ephesians. Give me a few scriptures to think of, think about. Ephesians chapter two and verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, that means we didn't understand what He did, made us alive together with Christ. When at the cross, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So not only did he save us, he he raised us, he buried us in baptism, raised us in resurrection power, seated us in heavenly places, did all this before you were even created. That's right. <laughs> Come on. Yep. It's good. Yep. Because yep. he did that all at the cro- on, on the cross. When we were dead in trash. Questions. Well, it's funny because that is a that when is an adverb of time that modifies the whole pa- passage. It says, "Turn around and look at the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, because at the same moment when it happened to Christ, it happened for all humanity." Yeah. So, when there is an adverb of time, yeah. the Greek word "made us alive with" is a single word. I won't say the word because I'll massacre it, but it basically means to reanimate conjointly, quicken together with. Raise this up is also another single word in the Greek. It's from sun and ergo, ergo, to rouse from death in company with, to revitify or uh, spiritually to resemble, to raise us up together. So people say, well, I felt this change in me when I accepted Jesus. That's what people will say. But when did that change actually happen? When did he actually revitify you? When did he actually change you? At the cross. But see, when you understand it, it's kind of like this, you know, it's kind of like a surprise party. The party was planned for a long time, for three, four months, and you were the one who didn't know about it, and when you find the, they go, surprise! You're like, Wow, that happened. And what happens in our brain, we have all these endorphins go off and it's all wonderful and we yeah. think, but this party has been planned for a long time. Yeah. You just didn't know about it. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's what happens. So raise this up together means to rouse from death in company with. And seated us with him, again, as another uh, comp pound word, and, and uh, it means to seat in company with, to sit down together. Let's look at a couple more verses and we're going to be done. In Second Timothy chapter 2, I think I've done this verse a few times for you too. Second Timothy Chapter 2 and verse 6. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Second Timothy 1 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Notice the word has, past tense. 
and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now we go back to Revelation 13.8, from the foundation of the world, before time began on this earth. So, here Paul's talking to Timothy. Before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior. So you notice it was from the foundation world, but now it's appeared, and we can see it because of Jesus. Okay? But it was from the foundation of the world. Uh, revealed by the appearing of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's abolished death. Not for just Christians. He took care of death once and for all at the cross. It's interesting, I won't read the scripture, but Hebrews 13.20 talks about the eternal. It means perpetual or past and future or before the world began. So here's Paul saying that, that believers were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. See, this is where Calvinism... Because they got mixed up. Because they're like, clearly I can, we can see that he chose us in him from the foundation of the world. So now you know where the Calvinistic goes. See, we were chosen, but not them. But I already proved to you, all of Adam was on the cross. But see, they didn't want to believe that. But for the first 500 years, all the early church fathers, four of the five, what we would call schools of the early church in the first, second, third, fourth century, all all believed in universal reconciliation. Only one did not. And that was the Latin school that was connected to Rome, which became the Catholic Church. They're the only one that didn't. But Rome got so powerful in the early church that in, I think, 550 or 600, somewhere around that, they decided that we're going to go totally with the Latin church and with this one group, and we're not going to believe in universal reconciliation anymore. And that... As a result of Augustine was pushing that because he, he, but he was in like 365 to, I don't know, 400s, which would be the 5th century. And so he started pushing that, and Rome got in bed with the church and decided that, no, the masses are stupid. We can't really teach them. They're all in Christ and that because they're just ignorant people. So we're going to put a lot of fear. We're going to put the fear of hell on them. We're going to put the fear of them missing missing God and not being accepted by God. We're going to produce a whole bunch of fear because that's how we can control people. How many know that's like the opposite of God? God is love. First Timothy 4.10 says this, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Nobody's teaching that hardly. Paul told Timothy, this is what you preach. He's the Savior of everybody. But if you understand it, you'll enjoy it. That's what especially means in the greatest degree, chiefly. Yep. Yep. 
the only way for people to enjoy the, the kingdom is to know about it and to know they've already been forgiven and they've already been accepted and they're already in it. And wake up to it. I'll just read these scriptures to you. John 4, 42, you can look them up later, says he's the savior of the world. John 1, 29 says, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the whole cosmos. Take away, there is to lift, to carry up or away. And get this, this is something that, that most people, when I first got awakened me to grace, it was in the book of Romans, and I started to see something, and it's called, in the Greek, it's the Strong's word 266, it's the word sin. There's multiple words for sin in the New Testament. The one is uh, 266, and, and the other one's 264, and that's the action of. It's the verb. But 266 is har- harmadius, uh, H-A-M something or other. But anyway, um, it's been a long time since I studied that. So anyway, that is the noun. Okay? So, behold the Lamb of God who took away the sin nature. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Behold the Lamb of God who took away the, carried it away on the cross, the sin nature of the world. I'm just going to tell you these scriptures. You can look up, up later if you want to do deeper study. Romans chapter 6, 3 through 12. We were baptized into his death. We were. So you know when it happened. When you were in Christ, you were baptized into his death. You were raised with him in resurrection power. You were seated with him. All at the cross. You died to sin. Once for all. All in those scriptures. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, the whole purpose is to bring us all to the, God the Father and have a good conscience towards God. That was the whole purpose. I got through all 14 pages and it's only noon. I'm pretty good. Look at that. I got a thumbs up. I got two thumbs up. Well, let's rehearse it. When was our sin removed? And if you really want to say in a spiritual way, from the foundation of the world. (laughs) What's that? It it never was. It was always in our mind. Yeah. Because the Bible says, he said, Austin said it was always in our mind. The Bible says that we were enemies in our own mind. And how many know when you think you're an enemy, you do stuff that you wouldn't normally do? Pastor Dominic thought that the Iraqis were his enemies. Mm-hmm. So he went and killed them. If he would have known they weren't his enemies, he would have had to like leave the army. So when were you buried with him? Not a trick question. With him. At with him. with him. At the cross. When were you raised? And when were you seated? So now our next thing is is learning to reign. Because he said we'll reign in life as a king by one Jesus Christ. All authority is given to him in heaven and in earth. Now go. Our message is, here's what Jesus did. You want to enjoy the kingdom? You want to eyes open to the kingdom? Then here's how you do it. This is what Jesus did. See, this is really quite a simple message, to be honest with you. And I'm going to... This is a message all the church understood for the first five centuries. The next time I preach, I think I'm going to preach, is God the Father of all? 
Is he? Because we, we pride ourselves. You know what happens is, is when we think we're special, like the whole world isn't included, that we get so prideful that we start pointing the finger, they're sinners, they're no good. They're the, the very people we're supposed to reach with the love of God. And we think there are enemies. I was taught, who don't associate with them. Don't go to dances. Don't go to, don't go to the movie theater. Don't go to bowling alleys. Don't go to this. Don't go to that. Because that sin, brother, will get on you and jump on you. And I'm telling you, you look like them and act like them and smell like them. Because they're smokers and drinkers. And I'm telling you, go to that bowling alley and you're going to smell like hell, brother. I always thought that. How many were taught that? Well, that's a good way to reach them. Well, let's just see if the Holy Spirit wants to do a thing today, and then if not, we'll be dismissed. But go ahead and come up. And I am so glad, you guys, that God is opening our eyes. There's more to come, more understanding. Revelation is progressive to us, because like if he downloaded all Revelation at once, it's like we'd be, like be totally mind blown. Because we'd be, but I've been taught, but this is, but I've been taught, but this is, Can we just t- take a moment and thank him for what he's done? You were on the cross that day with Jesus. Let's just take a moment and thank him. In however way you want to do it, thank him that you're holy and you're righteous and you're pure. Thank him that, that he doesn't count your sin anymore. There's no condemnation to you anymore. Thank him for that. You totally understand. It's like you mess up. It's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're not counting. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't know. I'm just thanking you for not counting anything. Thank you, Father. Come on, just lift your hands and thank him for a moment. Worship him and thank him. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so thankful, Father God, that you love me unconditionally with this supernatural unbelievable to us sometimes love I was on the cross that day with you Jesus <laughs> and now you say I look like you I choose to believe that that you are love and I am love and I have compassion because you are compassionate you are kind and I am kind You are long-suffering, and I am long-suffering. We are your beautiful bride. We're not getting without spot or wrinkle. That's how you already see us, is beautiful. You see us that way, Father. That's just... God, wash our brain. Just continually wash our brain with these truths of how much you love us. God, help us to kick out all the negative thoughts of you and all the parts our brain is an enemy to you, God, thinking you're against us or not really for us, that you don't want to reveal all your goodness to us, Father God, that somehow we got to earn it and work for it, Father. Father, we repent of those kind of mindsets. You're here for us. Scripture talks about we can't even comprehend how much you want to bless us and love us and take care of us, Father God. It's almost beyond our comprehension, but I know, Father, you want to reveal it to us. Let's just let go of negative thoughts today about God. Father, I let go of all negative thoughts that you would reject me someday if I wasn't perfect. 
I let go of negative thoughts, Father God, that I have to work for everything, that you just don't want to bless me just to bless me, Father God. But I let go of that negative thought, Father God, that, that, that you want to lavish me with gifts. I let go of the thought, Father God, that you have conditional love. I'm conditioned that I'm perfect, that I 